Welcome uh, to the new episode of the ILA Talk Show. Um, this is your host, Abhay Wadwa, live from New York City. I would like to welcome James Carpenter. Uh, of uh, you know, He's here in New York, and he has, uh, like I was saying, spent um, uh, many decades working in incorporating light within his architectural projects, especially natural light. And um, I am really looking forward to your presentation, James. Thanks for taking the time. It's great to have you on the show. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, Carrie, that was very, very intriguing, that whole uh, subject that you were bringing up in terms of engaging people in uh, basically these brave spaces or spaces where they can express themselves. Um, should I just launch in a little bit to a, in a talk, Abe? Sure, James. I mean, uh, I would love to, uh, just as a starting point, love to hear a little bit about your life story, how you got to where you are with, you know, uh, you've been uh, in the profession, uh, having your practice uh, for, I mean, you, 50 years you've been in the profession and then uh, you've had the practice in 1979, yes? Yeah, I started this studio in 1979. Yeah. Prior to that, yeah, prior to that, I began studying architecture, as, as, as you did, uh, and then uh, became a little bit more involved or definitely fully involved in the art world uh, mm -hmm. during the 70s, primarily with film, which I'll show you. Uh, okay. And uh, that uh, that was really uh, triggered really by an interest in exploring light and qualities of light that we see in nature mm -hmm. and deal with our perception of the, our surroundings, basically. Mm -hmm. So the work, the work is very much uh, grounded in this idea of how one can revisit nature or reawaken properties of nature that surround us uh, in urban environments and create more of a a new type of public space that's much, uh, much more of a collective experience, wonder of different qualities of light. Mm -hmm. But um, it's been a practice that uh, has essentially sort of developed sort of very organically over the, uh, the past 40, 50 years, uh, going from the art world. And then uh, uh, I'll show a few of those projects and then, and then being a little bit disillusioned mm. the production of product basically for the art world rather than uh, the environment art world in the 70s. Uh, and then trying to find a way of bringing some of the conceptual ideas from the art world into mm. architecture, into public spaces, uh, so that a broader, less preconditioned audience can sort of see and appreciate things uh, that might be triggering an awareness or excitement of something new in their uh, uh, in their their own experience, day-to-day -day experience. So I, I think it might be best if I launch into some of these slides. Um, and I'm not sure how we do screen sharing uh, at this point. You should have that little uh, green button at the bottom. Or if you want, uh, we can open it up on our side. Yeah. Now, there you go. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah, great. Okay, thank you. Um, so let me, uh, so this has been the focus of our work. I mean, obviously it's working at all different scales from very small scale, very intimate sort of private residence level installations in the art world and then involved in much larger projects, but uh, uh, just to begin a little bit of where uh, where I began understanding a little bit more about my own predilections or sort of interests in light, uh, I went to the Rhode Island School of Design and then uh, basically graduated in sculpture, although I started in architecture. And my work as sculpture were really films and groups of films uh, that basically established a new space when you walked into a gallery or what whatever museum space, you were actually confronted by uh, basically a different context, basically oftentimes sort of a natural context of you know, either birds or different, different things to do with uh, natural history. And this is just one example. This is a, a small river that was being managed by the University of Washington for salmon, uh, sort of genetic salmon trials. And uh, a friend of mine was doing his PhD there and we basically, set up a series of cameras, as you can see down here, this little sketch, early sketch of the project down below. 
series of cameras that sort of march up the stream uh, with cam films, actually cameras all sort of shooting down directly into the surface of the water uh, to sort of capture the activity in the stream. So you can see the blocking out of the images here on the top and sort of the actual projected images adjacent to it. Mm -hmm. And the interest uh, here is about what our eye actually tells us about these phenomenon or events that occur in front of us all the time, 100% of the time, how our eye actually tends to filter information unconsciously. And uh, my interest in this is really, what does our eye see when you slightly change the timing of a film? So you're obviously watching the movement of this migratory phenomenon, but the longer you look at this is, uh, the understanding of what you're seeing is not necessarily the rocks at the bottom of the stream or the water per se, or the fish moving through it. But the longer you look at this film, you realize that you're seeing a reflected image of the sky overhead. And this, this just sort of fascinates me how our eye makes very quick judgments of what surrounds us. Uh, but then if you allow yourself time, your eye begins to discern other, other levels of information and activation of space uh, created by light. And in this instance, it was really this awareness that uh, here you are next to a river, you assume you're just watching this migratory phenomenon, but if you really allow yourself to concentrate on this uh, sequence of events, you really understand you're seeing this reflection of the sky overhead. So there's this broad sort of recognition of things. And I think of the, the idea of uh, glass, uh, which is one of the materials I work with quite a bit, uh, is very much like that stream. I mean, the glass is a transparent material and transparency is not a, in my mind, not a good word. Uh, because if you take a transparent material such as glass, obviously you see information beyond the material. There's visual information within the material. There's another layer of visual, visual information upon the material. So you have actually a transparent material, but in fact, it's compressing multiple facets of its surrounding context. And the, if you're carefully observing this, you're actually seeing all these different components of our surrounding within a clear piece of glass. And this is, this is very key understanding of this. This is what your eye sees glass as a transparent material. It refuses to acknowledge the information that exists upon it, within it, and beyond it. So it's a, very, it's a very curious thing that we have in our uh, sort of psychology in terms of vision and perception. So taking that project that I showed you of the films and I was doing a lot of work in film installations here in New York and in Europe and different museums in the seventies, towards the latter part of the seventies, the art world basically became more uh, about expressionist painting, people like Sandro Kia and Schnabel and all those people and basically moved away from the conceptual art or earth art that was happening earlier. And I wanted to try to find a way to hold on to the ideas that I was working with in the art world yeah. in a more permanent condition, not a temporary condition. So this is a glass bridge uh, done for a family in California who had a, quite an extensive art collection. And it's a bridge in the sense that uh, it's a glass platform about 100 feet long running over the surface of a stream. And you access the bridge by walking out on a gangway which is an abutment to the bridge, moving along this platform to the other side of the river. The whole idea here is you're building a structure which carries with it many of the components of light phenomenon that is, is, is immersing you when you actually look and experience this environment. So these, these works are really about trying to have us dwell longer within a particular environment or ecology and gain a richer sense of what's happening to us and around us. And this bridge obviously is dealing with caustic reflections as the walking surface and then very light transparent coatings that sort of coalesce and capture surrounding pieces of the environment and overlap them and you move down the bridge off to the other side. So anyway, the, these types of build works is really, really what continues to be, you know, built into all of our projects in one way, shape, or form. And then this is a project in uh, Australia for the Olympics in Sydney, and uh, this was all about recapturing 
a highly toxic landscape outside of Sydney. There was a big industrial park, oil refinery, abattoirs, and all sorts of very uh, nasty industries, cleaning up that environment and returning it to public use for the Olympic Park. Uh, and what we chose to do as part of that uh, sort of program for the Olympics of sort of appreciating the landscape and renewing landscape and making turning the landscape back to public use. Uh, we did this small bridge. This is a pedestrian bridge that leads from athletes housing and all the, the arrival to the park, the main entry into the Olympic Park crossing this bridge. And you go over this very small mangrove, tidal mangrove river. And what we did is we built these masts. You can see them here. This is basically the gateway or threshold into the Olympic Park. And there are a series of masts coming up out of the river. So if you just look at a diagram, a very simple diagram of this project, uh, the river obviously below here, uh, below the bridge, people moving along the bridge overhead. The masts come up out of the uh, river bed, essentially within the mangrove, the grove of mangroves below us. And what we're doing is we're actually taking the water from the stream, filtering it, and under high pressure, moving it to the top of these masts where there's a misting system, a stainless steel misting system at the top. Mm. So you're effectively trying to take water and produce a cloud overhead. It's sort of this idea of evaporation of water, condensation of water in the atmosphere over your head, and then create this misting cloud above you. And in order to trigger people's awareness of this, in the distance, quite a ways away, is a heliostat. The heliostat is a device that tracks the sun all day long, mm. but projects a constant beam of light back through this alignment of mass. So the sun is coming down, bouncing light through the, uh, through the mist. And to understand how to make things visible to the eye in the daytime, the mirror on top of that heliostat is actually a dichroic mirror, meaning it's a glass which filters the full spectrum of both visible and invisible light uh, down to a narrower band of wavelengths. In this case, the glass is allowing all the blue light to pass through it and it's only reflecting or rejecting uh, the yellow end of the spectrum. So yellow is of course, as you all know, studying color, is one of the most uh, apparent colors to the eye. The eye sort of sees yellow uh, quite easily within all different conditions. And in this case, uh, we sort of learned this almost by default. If this sort of were a conventional mirror, you actually would hardly see this you would hardly see this beam of light. And it's only that we've actually filtered the light that this becomes more apparent. So the notion here is how do you create bars of light or color overhead uh, during the day under direct sun? So we all know the direct sun is so incredibly powerful uh, that it's very hard to uh, over, let's say overwhelm. You don't necessarily want to overcome it, but how do, how do you, work with something that's that intense. And by actually filtering the light, and this is our dichroic mirror in the distance, the sun is coming down and bouncing a beam of light through here. It's always to me, when I'm thinking about light or working with light, it's always about the target. I mean, like, what is it that makes the light present? And this is something we don't give enough consideration to. The light is everywhere. It's everywhere around us, but it's only made present by hitting something that allows it to reveal itself. So that's sort of a fundamental mystery. I mean, you have to have a target or a subject upon which light can reveal itself. So in this instance, a mist, so it's a cloud, a synthetic cloud. And this bar of light, depending on the weather conditions, can be these fragmentary patches of light, as you see here, or under an overcast day, higher humidity, this becomes a much more of a consistent beam. And the beam of light can in fact, can in fact actually go for up to a half a mile or a mile. But the whole idea here is people walking into the park, you're over a mangrove stream, you look overhead, there's this bar of misting and cloud. 
with this beam of light that's sort of appearing and disappearing depending on the weather conditions uh, to sort of just spark your awareness and consciousness of, of an event that's happening of moisture from the surface of the earth ascending into the sky cools and then redescending to the earth you know obviously it's rainfall so just a way of sort of taking a cycle uh, that is happening all the time uh, and bring it to your attention. And then a different project, say, you know, jumping into an urban context, which is obviously where we often find ourselves uh, working. Uh, this is here in New York City. It's the Hearst Building, uh, Tower by Foster. And uh, we work with them. We've worked with them many projects over the years, but this particular project, we work with them on establishing sort of these clear story lights and uh, skylights within this large atrium space that resides within this hollowed out skin of the original building. And what is of interest is the entry to this original building, which was done in 1928, uh, is quite small. I mean, back in that time, entries were, this would have been actually a grand entry, you know, 100 years ago. Uh, but today it's rather restrictive relative to one looking into a new building and particularly restrictive in terms of light because it's a fairly dark opening. So our primary goal here was, here's that little arched entry we just looked at. You're coming in off of 8th Avenue. You're under bright sun out on the street always. Typically looking into a darker environment, right? And this is one of the issues of entering a building is that the building lighting conditions obviously cannot be as bright as the sun on the street outside. So we basically use a very simple principle of a periscope. So here you have an inclined surface of prisms, reflective, a reflective surface, let's say. We have a lot of sky brightness and direct sun coming in overhead. So the whole principle here is very simple. When you look into the building, you're looking at a periscope, periscopic surface, and you're in fact looking out of the building. So we're bringing all of that daylight in and projecting it out to your eye or vice versa, your eyes looking in and looking back out. So that's how it functions relative to the use of daylight. And then secondarily, we're gathering the rainwater on the roof of the building. Again, bringing it down, filtering it and cooling it. Uh, you know, not dissimilar to the Australian project, filtering it and cooling it in this instance, and then running the chilled water over this inclined surface. And therefore, it's actually the cooling system uh, through convection, uh, chilled water, chilled cooler air being circulated and then stratifying this large public space. So the cool air exists where people occupy the space and the warmer air exists uh, essentially in the non-occupied spaces. So the surface that you're looking at is essentially a field of prisms. This is just making one of the prisms out of cast glass. And then those prisms are installed into this inclined surface uh, that you ascend and descend as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a person working in this building or a guest visiting this building. Uh, and you have this moment in time upon entry into the building, hopefully a moment of more repose or quiet. Uh, the water is obviously rippling. It has sort of an acoustical uh, frequency in the space of running water. It's uh, tuned to the population, meaning that the more people entering the space, the more water flow, both for cooling and white noise runs over the surface. Uh, and then everybody shares this moment in their day of having this reconnection to an event of light, sound, water, a different type of sort of connection to nature that uh, <laughs> is very foreign to our experience typically in the city. And uh, on a much smaller scale, I think this is, uh, again, I'm going to sort of pull the several projects together here that work with this notion of periscopic light. Uh, this is a private residence uh, for an elderly couple that moved from the suburbs of uh, Minneapolis with a very beautiful art collection, a very beautiful modern house done in the 60s. They hired uh, uh, a young architect in uh, Minnesota, Vince James and myself to work on this uh, new house. They wanted to live in the city, be close to the Walker Art Center, 
where most of their collection is and feel like they're still living in nature. So we worked on all the glazing on the house and the whole house can be shut down, meaning that it has a, louver, a wood louvering system that you can close down any room to any degree you wish, like totally closed or partially open and has great variability in terms of privacy or connection to nature. Uh, and there was one window, and that's the point of this particular presentation, one window which was compromised basically by a neighboring building and a stone wall and a fence that you can see here. And I sort of refer to it as a window without a view. Uh, so uh, windows, again, as I said earlier, we take for granted. Uh, but actually probably about 60 or 70% of all windows don't have a view at all. Uh, and this is uh, how one might think about creating a window, but it's a window that allows you to construct a different idea of your surroundings. So yeah. you're looking at it under construction just to let you understand how what it is. It's a field of very simple lenses uh, suspended. And behind each row of lenses is a tilted mirror, all at a slightly different angle. And yeah. you can obviously see the mirror is seeing the sky. The mirror is seeing the treetops, the leaves and the trees. The mirror is obviously bringing the view from directly overhead down into the window plane where the lenses can see it. And then by adding a layer of diffuse glass on the interior of the building, the lens is actually creating a new reality. And this is, this is, this is the information outside your window collected from a broader perspective than one would typically get within a window. It's using lensing and mirrors to expand our vision area, collect it and represent it. So it has this remarkable quality of capturing things mm. in many different ways all day long and all night long. You're actually looking at the top of a tree here. So if you look at the, each of these looks, it's like a video monitor, but it's obviously not a video screen. It's just basically direct projection. So you see the treetops here when it's in shadow. And then you see the then you see the projection of the leaves themselves, and then you get these apertures that are openings within the tree itself, broadcast on the on the on the wall or broadcast into the space. So you can look at this, and I've seen this in the winter, and I need to film this sometime soon. Hmm. Uh, where in the winter, no leaves on the trees, white outside, full moon, every one of these lenses presents an image of the moon. So it's a field of 80 images of the moon wow. sitting within this dark expanse of the starry sky. Yeah. So it's a way of, uh, I think, how do we rethink our connection to our surroundings with something that's a little bit more than a window? Because uh, windows are very limited. And this is a, a different way of thinking about that idea. This is here again in New York. I'm going to talk about this building in a moment, but just for the time being, speak about this building. This is Broadway, and uh, this is a new building. It's a fairly small building, uh, but it interconnects all the underground subway state, uh, uh, lines downtown. And our job was really about bringing daylight into this space and bringing daylight below ground. So. This is an early drawing of ours for this competition, which we uh, fortunately prevailed in. And it was about how we might use daylight in all of our subway stations, bring light below ground, sort of activate, use it for wayfinding, increase our sense of connection to the outside world through daylight. But most importantly, the effort was really focused on this uh, part of it. This is this glass pavilion on Broadway mostly underground, it just sits, sits uh, over this uh, below ground space, about two levels below ground. And this is the earliest idea for this. And uh, uh, we are thinking of this as a, over time, we came up with a very different shape. You might recall in this instance, it's more of a inflated form, let's say, but we ended up with, let's call it a deflated form, but it's actually a toroid, toroidal shape. So it's, it's cupped, cupped in, and, the aperture, here's the window aperture. This is again an idea that's related to that small window I just showed you. Here's the smaller aperture. It's not so small, but it's an aperture of the skylight. Normally when you have a skylight, 
And here, here's an example of somebody standing below the skylight. Your view of the sky is restricted by the perimeter condition of that window or that skylight. However, if you shape the contours around that window, all of a sudden, if I look up at this surface here, I'm in fact looking at the sky way over here. Or if I look up at this surface here, I'm actually looking at the sky over here. So this form, again, sort of broadens rather than this restricted view of the sky, all of a sudden now our view of the sky is much broader. And it's just a simple optical principle. And this shows you how it's made and how it's installed. It comes like a great big oriental carpet bundled up. It's a cable structure. Uh, it's secured at only two locations in the building. It's secured at the perimeter of the skylight and then secured at the perimeter of the first floor and then tensioned. And then that, that system is clad with a, a type of aluminum. It's actually an optical aluminum, meaning that it has optical properties in terms of both uh, light reflectance levels, but more importantly, it has a characteristic of materials that we don't always pay attention to. And, and, and for us, when I spoke earlier about this idea of light always having to have a target, yes, you need a surface to for the light to fall upon. But if this particular project were done like in a mirror type finish or a finish that has high reflectance to it, you, you would not see this at all. It'd be too shiny. It'd be like it wouldn't carry or what I call hold the visual image. What you're looking at here, this is a cloud in the sky and this is the sky outside the building, brought into the building. So. I'm looking at a cloud that's actually over my head, behind me. So mm -hmm. that view angle I told you before, I'm looking at this curve, but in fact, my eye is looking back over my head. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can, at certain times of day, you can see this. You can't see it in the middle of the day because there's too much light, but morning, afternoon, you can see this where the clouds are actually moving in the space with you. So it's this notion of, in some ways, revisiting you know, the earlier thoughts of theater, Greek theater, say, like out under the sky itself, but not necessarily just trying to paint the image of the sky or reproduce the image of the sky in some way, but in fact, have the sky itself be present within the space with you. So this is a space, you know, it's a public transit place. There's, you know, pre-pandemic, about 300,000 people a day move through here. And obviously the hope of this project and all the things I'm showing you is that when you move through this space, we all see something different. Whatever place you're standing in the building, you're seeing something different from one another. However, collectively, you're all responding to this event brought into your life, typically very harried and busy and running as we all do here in New York. But all of a sudden there's a moment of repose and sharing something that has a connection to you know, the world beyond the city we're in. And this is also not a view you're gonna get. If you stepped out into the street, you know what the sky looks like when you're in the arc looking up. It's framed by tall buildings. So you don't normally equate this sort of view to a view uh, that you see uh, in the country. Mm -hmm. so there it is. And then it's one last quick project. This is in the same neighborhood. The, the project we just looked at is roughly here. This is World Trade Center Tower 7. This is the first building going up after 9-11. So <clears throat> this to your, I mean, Pei and I spoke the other day about, about the ILA and, and this interest mm -hmm. in light having a, a having sort of connection for all of us and a benefit for all of us mm -hmm. uh, collectively and not, not necessarily just uh, individually. Uh, and then Tower 7 had a lot of responsibility. Here it is, this is the World Trade Center site, obviously after it, uh, after the building collapsed. This is Tower 7 just starting. And the responsibility here was to build a building, and this is with Skidmore, build a building that actually, what we brought to the project, responds to light in a way that no other building does in, the, in anywhere really. Uh, but takes advantage of the remarkable quality of light we have here in New York, which is we're on an island surrounded by two major rivers and the ocean. 
lots of atmospheric moisture, a lot of clear days, a lot of light interacting with that moisture in the air. So our light is very physical, it's very present. So we wanted this building to respond to that. So this, this is the beginning of the building and the, what was important about this building and why it went up so quickly was it's actually the power substation for Con Edison for downtown Manhattan, which was destroyed. And we all lost power here. We lost power here in my studio because we're just not so many blocks from this site. Uh, so the whole notion of reinventing downtown New York to be more welcoming, more pedestrian, more engaging. Here we are starting with eight stories of concrete, not a particularly friendly uh, presence. Uh, so what we propose for the base of the building is uh, a system where we use prisms again, very simple. These prisms have to be made out of stainless steel, but they enclose those transformers at the base of the building. And what you're looking at here is actually an early drawing or diagram of how, how the skin of the building, if I'm looking at the building, where, or if I actually, the way to, to explain this, if I put my back to the building and looked out to the street, this, this, this drawing represents what's behind me. Like the light is coming down the streets. We have fairly narrow streets in this area. Lights coming down the streets very obliquely. There are openings in the sky plane opposite you or down the road, down the street. So this is a diagram of available light areas on the opposing elevation of the street. And this was accomplished by building this double wall, like an outdoor screen, an indoor screen. You can see an outer surface here that responds to daylight, an inner surface that responds to artificial light that's built into the system here. Mm -hmm. uh, but just by rotating these prisms, these are rotated about 15 degrees from this, this, this row of prisms you end up with a fairly quiet surface, but a very active surface relative to responsiveness uh, to light. This is the going up over the waterproofing and the transformers. This all had to be demountable. You move transformers in, move transformers out. It has to be blast resistant for the pedestrian in case the transformers explode. It has to be 50% open for natural ventilation. Uh, and uh, then it becomes this wrapper basically for the industrial part of the building. And then in the, in the evening, these artificial lights come on and they're actually controlled by a series of cameras that are mounted along the facade here that look at the sidewalk. And as people move along the sidewalk, the light actually moves with you. Uh, so the building is very much uh, coordinated to the movement of people in the building. Uh, and that's sort of the base of the building. Then the upper part of the building, which is the occupied part of the building. And just briefly, this is uh, this discussion I started when we first spoke about this. When you put up a building of this size, you're obviously consuming public real estate or skyscape, let's, get, let's say. A tall building consumes a public resource of available light to the street. So uh, we think, and we try to work in our build, all of our projects that you, on the one hand, you can think of a tall building as privatization of a public resource. And you're obviously doing your best to make that work environment the most light responsive, best quality daylighting conditions, most productive workspace possible. But there's a reciprocal responsibility in terms of designing a curtain wall, in terms of how it gives back to the environment that it has just shut off from light. Uh, so this building, I think, does that in several ways. But uh, this is a detail of the curtain wall here in my studio. And uh, what's normally called the structural or spandrel part of the building, you can see here, there are reflectors built into the building uh, down here at the sill, which you don't see from the street. Uh, the, they're blue, actually, blue stainless steel reflectors. And this is the idea for a part of the building that sunlight's falling on the panels, but normally the sun is obviously coming from above, creates a shadow underneath the corrugated surface. But by introducing a reflector at the sill, sunlight is still falling on the upper part of that curved surface, but we're actually bouncing blue light back up into what would otherwise be a shadow. You can see that here. This is shadow, but here we have blue light going into it. So this is happening on this building all the time. And uh, a little principle you have here, 
And the whole goal of this is essentially that uh, your building responds to its surroundings, both the base of the building and this upper part of the building, where sometimes you see, I just saw, I just took this picture about two weeks ago when I went to get my vaccine on the left. You can walk down the street and all of a sudden certain angles, every one of these lighting reflectors shines and glows, lights up, and it has this dynamic to it from, you know, quarter mile, half mile, mile away. And then if you're under it or just, there's another condition on the right, just it's always changing, always responding to its surroundings. It basically sits as this large, in my mind, this large device, which is all about reawakening our understanding of the presence of light within our urban environment and making it something that is remarkable and hopefully enjoyable and something that we all sort of can look at and learn something or discover something at any time of day or any time of the evening. So I think that's a little bit just trying to summarize, you know, in, with, with a few projects, what, what intrigues us here in the studio and uh, what, we, uh, what we try to engage with in most all of these projects. So I, I hope I didn't go too long. No, Which this I, is uh, fantastic, James. Thank you. Um, and perfect on the timing as well, because it leaves us with uh, 10 minutes for the many questions that have come in while you were talking. I don't want to interrupt your flow because it was right. um, really uplifting. Um, so shall we jump into the questions? Mm -hmm. Okay, super. Um, so this one question, I'll just read the whole uh, paragraph out for... Um, um, our audience as well. We will spend our time in your design spaces for minutes or a few hours, walking over a bridge or up a staircase on our way to work or walking down the street. It is for many of the projects, spaces we spend limited time in. Spending a longer time in a place will again change our perception of what we see and how it influences us. Does the idea about time affect your work in any way? And how do you work with time as media beyond light? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a question. Oh, good. Well, I think that, uh, as I said at the very beginning, most of our work is, is, is daylight driven. And that can mean before sunrise to after sunset. <laughs> so even the lowest levels of light in the sky to obviously the most intense or extreme amounts of light, depending on where you are uh, in the sky. So, so the temporal aspect of the work is, is, is definitely there. And it's definitely part and parcel of what we're thinking about at the very, very beginning. Right. And, uh, and in answer to uh, Beyond Time, I would just sort of say, let me just explain one project, which is a, pro a subject that we've been working on for quite a long time. Uh, is qualities of darkness, qualities, qualities of light that exist within darkness. And uh, we've done some work for the indigenous government in uh, Greenland, for the Inuit government in, 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 uh, in Greenland, about how to reclaim darkness uh, and the qualities of light that they were experienced with prior to the importation of artificial lighting from the Danes. Uh, uh, a lot of the work we did with them is we did several sculptural projects that just deal with reflected light off of snow mm. uh, and also the reduction of street lighting and walkway lighting and trying to take advantage of lower levels of light bounced off the snow, um, which is adequate. And then this is the thing I think that we, and this I guess starts getting into your question about other than time. Uh, light has remarkable obviously, physiological, uh, physiological and psychological impact to our lives. And we're fully aware of that and we try to work with that. But this project in Greenland, I think, was, uh, and then we've done some other projects in similar environments in Northern Labrador, uh, has more to do with recapturing a stronger and more powerful cultural connection to qualities of light. So we tend to, so we tend to overlook this. Uh, and I think it's a very deeply held quality we have within us. And certainly we have our whole chronobiology and all of that that's telling us all this information, which we 
obviously are always trying to override. Uh, but it is this, this part of it, I think, that's most intriguing is that how do we create moments in time? And I think this is a little bit what these projects are about. You're quite right. It's about a delay. It's about a, a slowing things down. It's about giving you a moment to respond, not just your eye, but physiologically respond, not just a glance to see something, but right. what is the meaning to me in a deeper way or deeper level? And that's like that project in the, at the Hearst building I showed. It's, it's sort yeah. of oral, it's sound. It's a very beautiful sound, running water. It's cooling simultaneously. And it's obviously all about light. It's, it's light, this, this dancing of water over over these prisms. So it's it's, it's very dynamic quality of light. Hey, hey. Uh, all of those things, to my mind, create, I mean, you might say it's, it's poetic, but I, but I also think it's sort of harking back to things we all share. Mm. And that's again, getting beyond time. I mean, it's, 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 it's maybe not getting beyond time, but maybe it's getting into time in a deeper way. Deeper way, uh, yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. Well, there, there are a lot of questions that have come to me as direct messages as well. So let me try chipping away at as many as I can. Um, the other question is about your choice of materials, right? I mean, um, you work with dichroics, you work with lenses, you work with prisms, you work with mist, uh, you work with film as the starting point uh, with that beautiful project that you did, um, the bridge. What do you, if you were to hazard a guess, or, or maybe you're working on it already, what is this one material that intrigues you uh, in the near future that may be implemented in this new project that you're working in? Can you share uh, where your creative projects are headed? I mean, in terms of materiality? Well, I think when you, when you sort of bring up a subject that I've been sort of struggling with for quite a long time. It's like how to recapture the anim. I mean, we've been talking about the animation generated by daylight mm -hmm. and your your movement, typically in relationship to the sun's position in the sky. Uh, but we're also in the films. You're really talking about a different type of animation. And I, what I've been trying to get closer to, without necessarily going to film, although film or some method of recording may enter into some of our projects. I'm quite interested in uh, OLEDs, actually, OLEDs. Yeah. As, you know. And uh, I can very much see an opportunity where spaces actually contain recollections of moments that light time, let's call it light time. So the, the space you're in might, might recall, you know, a moment of remarkable light that happened in that same space five years previously or something. I mean, there's a way of bringing about a, a recording of events that happened in a space that can keep keep that memory alive with qualities that exist. So there's somehow, I think, a way to capture memory, capture exception, capture you know experience in a way that recalls all these things. And uh, and it, it, it used to like be very, very subtle. It can be extremely yeah. subtle. I mean, most of us don't give ourselves time to uh, dwell on, uh, dwell, uh, dwell time, let's say, to, 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 to recognize things that exist within subtlety. Yeah. A, a yeah. project like Greenland, Greenland have been uh, helpful in that regard, is that there is a, you know, an inherent understanding of incredibly subtle qualities of light. Light, yeah, yeah. It also, also directly correspond, you brought up materiality, but also co coordinate with various attributes of snow, mm -hmm. which are, you know, there's thousands of different conditions, crystalline, solid, I mean, right. of, of that, and each of them responds differently to, to light. Yeah. Yeah. There's that whole thing about different types of snowflakes and there's, 64 different types of snowflakes. In fact, no, I would send you a link to, since you've been doing this work with snow, of one of our board members uh, who worked with uh, a Japanese uh, scientist um, uh, who worked with water. Um, and uh, and then he kind of got it, he's from Austria, he's not here today, but he would have jumped in on this because that's been his uh, favorite topic for years. 
Uh, so, um, sorry. I have, his, I have his books. <laughs> I do, okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I've been also deeply impacted by it. And then of course the work of, you spoke about darkness. So the work of Junichiro Tanazaki becomes kind of, you know, the obvious connect from the Eastern perspective, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in praise of shadows and praise of darkness. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's been a phenomenal, um, uh, a phenomenally impactful work for us also in our architectural projects is that when did darkness become bad? Somewhere along the line, somebody said darkness is ooh, scary. You know, when did that happen? Why did it happen? And I'll send you a link to it. I think um, you'll enjoy at least my hypothesis on it, <laughs> you know. Um, but uh, let me move on to the next question. I, there's so many of them that have come in, but I'm not gonna be able to get to all of them because we're running out of time, but um, I'll get to this one here, which is, um, uh, the human visual system is very complex and hard to understand uh, its phenomena. You've excelled in handling the materials, environment, and human experience in such a beautiful way. Hats off to you, Mr. James Carpenter. Your contribution to society is outstanding. It's wonderful things. Do you create a mock-up before actual implementation? And how do you sell to the client since it is unique and each project has its merit? And uh, a more uh, subjective, I guess, uh, more kind of, um, I don't know how you answer this, but how did you come to such creativity? Um, so three questions, I guess, part, you know, of what he's posed. Or yeah. posed well, I, I guess um, first part, first part has to do with mock-ups or with uh, how, how we explore an idea. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, you can look around here a little bit. This is basically, yeah. Yeah. This is basically a workshop, you know, my studio. Uh, there's only a couple of people here because we're all working remotely generally, except me. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's, a, it's an environment which obviously we have great light in this particular space, but it's an environment where we are constantly working with new materials, working with glass, and turning, I mean, when I say working with glass, I mean, that's a material that I became very much you know, connected with back in the 70s, I worked for Corning Glass, which is a large technical glass company. Sure. Uh, got very immersed in glass in a very in a technical way. Uh, and that's sort of how I got back into doing these bigger architectural projects. But anyway, yes, we do work with mock-ups of all different scales, starting with smaller, you know, tabletop things, just to explore an idea, to verify some of our thinking and idea, then we build up to larger scale mock-ups, and if I turn this camera the other way, you're looking at a mock-up right here next to me, which are 12 foot tall uh, pieces for a new terminal building in San Diego, which is a glass, a glass pre soleil system on a new building. Uh, so we work with mock-ups uh, in our studio, full scale, and we try to get them up and built early. So we actually, this has been here now for several months, but we'll study this thing for a longer period, a longer period of time, and then use that time to sort of refine our thinking about it. And then eventually it moves to glass mock-up pieces and the same thing will happen. And then the second part of your question is how do you convince clients to do something like this? Well, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a leap of faith, but sometimes I guess, but we've proven We've proven we can do these things technically and aesthetically at a large scale, and uh, several architects have supported us in that regard. But quite frankly, like a project like Tower Seven, uh, which is you know it's a pretty good sized building, it's about fifty stories, and uh, uh, every single meeting with the client took place right here at this table where I'm sitting right now. We have full scale mockups of things, and having those mockups that can actually demonstrate what you're talking about very early on sort of gives them confidence in what you're proposing is achievable and you've got decision making happening uh, based on actual tangible things and then and therefore you don't have a lot of go forward go backwards go forward go backwards you have a lot, a lot of times try to get a more linear decision making process which allows some of these things to get built economically you know, on a larger scale. Uh, and then the third question, let's see, uh, I guess what was the third one, was that how do we get them to pay for it? Is that it? Was uh, it was the, yeah, how did you, how did you, um, how do you get to this kind of creativity? 
<laughs> What's your special diet? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, I've always, uh, you know, I, I didn't, didn't explain exactly. I, I went to the Rhode Island School of Design prior to that. I was just very interested in, you know, I was interested in botany and I worked down in South America for a couple of summers in the Amazon collecting plants. Nice. And worked up in Labrador doing different things. But natural history was always has always been very strong for me. And actually at RISB, I was asked, there was a, a natural history museum at the Rhode Island School of Design. And I helped the woman who ran it and started it when I was a student. And uh, she asked me, uh, I was teaching in Berkeley, and she wrote me during the winter time there, wrote me during the winter and said, well, I, I, I'm thinking of retiring. And, I've spent 35 years, four years building up this natural history museum. I don't know who else would be able to take this over. So she asked me to come back to RISD and sort of take over the natural history museum. So my, my career is really locked into natural history in many ways. And I think that's the underlying inspiration yeah. and this reliance on daylight and, and materials. And I like fishing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, this is so great. I really, I mean, I'm deeply thankful from on behalf of the ILA and all of our guests for you taking the time. I, I, I know you're very busy. I know you've got some great projects going and uh, I appreciate you and your team taking the time to coordinate the details with us. And uh, I hope you will come back and um, be a guest on our show in the near future, you know, because we're going to be doing this um, every two weeks. Um, so thank you, James, for your time. And uh, such a pleasure having you here. Really, I just want to say I really respect uh, obviously your work uh, individually, but also the whole work of your ILA organization. And it's such an important thing for people to, in all different ways, obviously we do it in one way, but you know, this whole broadcasting, yeah. a more sympathetic understanding of light and the human's reaction to light and color is so important for everyone's betterment. So uh, yeah. look forward to participating on any of your Thank okay. you. You're welcome. Great. Thank you all.